Hey everybody, Cole here with Classic Mini DIY and I'm standing off to the side here because the first big shipment of parts has finally arrived. Um, I'm super, super excited. Um, I'm so excited in fact that I'm not even going to be doing any work on this episode. I just really wanted to share with you guys some of the things that I'm getting for this build that a lot of people might not think that they need or might not think about when they're you know, doing a big engine build like this, and to give you guys kind of an idea of how this stuff can add up so quickly. So, um, first things first, I do wanna say a huge, huge thank you to Seven Mini Parts. Some of the parts that you guys see up here are from them. They have been a long time part sponsor of this channel and I wanna thank them so much for all the support they've given me over the years. If you guys are looking for classic mini parts and you are in North America, head over to 7 Mini Parts in the link in my description and uh, show them a little bit of love and tell them that I sent you. Also, I do wanna say a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. Big, big builds like this literally would be completely impossible without your help, so I do wanna say Thank you so much, guys, and thank you for helping make this possible. If you wanna see more stuff like this in the future, head over to the link in the description as well for Patreon. Now, what we're looking at here is an assortment of parts, most of which don't actually go on the engine or even around the engine, as you can see by this enormous fuel tank that I have over here. And it's some of the supplementary items that I need because right now we're still waiting on the crankshaft because right now we're still waiting on the crankshaft, the connecting rods, the pistons, the LSD. Um, most of the internal components are still getting worked on either by Paul Jeffries, MED, who is waiting for the Omega pistons, the 18cc pistons to get in stock so I can buy those. I'm getting my new Verto clutch modified over in the UK. I'm gonna cover that in a future episode. And then of course the EFI system, I'm still in progress in getting that ironed out. Holly EFI is gonna be supporting this channel and providing me a discount on their EFI system. So it's gonna help me out obviously a ton with this build because it's getting really expensive. And it's gonna give me the opportunity to work with someone at Holly to give you guys all the information about this EFI that I might otherwise not know. Now first things first, this fuel tank. Now this is a brand new fuel tank and you might be wondering, Cole, why'd you have to get a new fuel tank? You have one in your mini, doesn't that work? Well, unfortunately it won't work as, it won't work as stock because what this EFI system requires is a return fuel line. So you have fuel running to the EFI, going through the injection system, putting fuel into your combustion chambers, boom, but there's excess, because of the way the EFI works, there's excess fuel and it needs to maintain fuel pressure. So what happens is it sends fuel back to the fuel tank that's unused during the combustion process and then that gets re-added back into your fuel tank, recirculated, and back up it goes. So, so what I was thinking I might do, and just below this uh, uh, workbench here is a fuel tank that I was gonna modify with a return line, however, I can't find anybody to weld this thing. Um, you really have to clean a fuel tank, like professionally clean it in order to be able to weld on it because even after a fuel tank's been empty for years, it still has gasoline fumes in it, which can cause an explosion. So I couldn't find anyone here in Charlotte to do that for me. So I had to ditch that idea and uh, I decided, you know what, I'm just gonna pull the trigger. I bought a brand new SPI fuel tank. You can tell it's SPI because this big hole in the top right here, this is for the fuel pump. It's all included, so there's a fuel filter, pump, everything, it sits right down inside the tank. New sender unit. And then of course, obviously, it's a brand new tank. Now, the nice thing about this is that my fuel gauge on my car is a later fuel gauge. So for the first time in the 11 years that I've owned my car, I'm gonna actually be able to get an accurate fuel reading. I'm pretty excited about that. So um, the pump, obviously not in there yet. It ha That is on back order, so I'm waiting for that to come in. And then that's gonna head its way over here into Charlotte. And uh, I'll talk more about that when we get there. Now some things up here are actually kind of commonplace parts for uh, big builds or, or high heat builds. Now with the supercharger, it generates a lot more heat than a standard carburetor would. It also generates a lot more heat than really any sort of non-naturally aspirated engine would. And as a result, it's very important for you to keep the area around the fuel injection system and around the supercharger itself as cool as possible. So there's a couple ways that I'm combating that. One is I have something called a charge cooler. 
I will go deep into that when we get to that stage of the build, but basically that cools the air as it's going out of the supercharger and into the actual engine. There's tons of heat shielding underneath the supercharger itself that came on the supercharger. But additionally, I'm gonna be adding an exhaust wrap. Now this is black fiberglass exhaust wrap. You've seen it on motorcycles, you've seen it on all sorts of stuff. And there's a lot of controversy about these uh, exhaust wraps because what they do is they promote rust on your exhaust system. Now, when you wrap it, it keeps all that heat in, which is cool, it's great. Keeps the heat in the exhaust, away from the things around it and going out the back of the exhaust system. However, this also traps moisture inside your exhaust system or at least around it. So it does kind of lead to a premature rusting of your exhaust. Now, I'm okay with that. It's not like it's gonna suddenly rust out just like that, but um, it is something to keep in mind. So I am also trying something different this is a high temp silicone coating. Um, it's made by the same people who make this exhaust wrap. Um, I'm not exactly sure either you spray it on top of the actual uh, um, finish. I, yeah. I'm gonna have to do a little bit of reading on this, but from my understanding, you either spray it on top of the exhaust wrap or on your exhaust itself. It does burn off a little bit there right after your first startup, but it's supposed to help protect it. So we'll see how that goes and I'll report back that. Uh, a little bit later, but I do know the risks associated with exhaust wraps, and I wanna make it clear that there are risks associated with it. Um, some people might suggest ceramic coating your exhaust, which is a great alternative, um, but it is a little bit more money, and uh, it's just something to consider whether or not you wanna spend it. Now there's my water pump. I also got new. This is a new uh, battery terminal. So what this is gonna allow me to do is run dedicated lines more easily for the EFI system. With the Holly EFI, you absolutely have to have the, uh, the terminals, you have to have run the wire all the way from the EFI directly to the battery terminals. You need a constant good 12 volt connection in order to run your EFI system. And this has some additional holes in the back so you can run your battery cables, high gauge, and then you can also run some smaller gauge wires. It's pretty cool, we can give it a shot. This is an Amazon purchase, I don't know, you know how nice it's actually gonna end up being, but we will find out. We've got ARP studs here. Um, this is ARP head studs, ARP connecting rod bolts, and I'm also gonna be doing ARP main cap bolts with some additional stuff that's still on order. And then I've got some sticky heat resistant gold wrap. Now, what I'm gonna do with this, and I think I didn't order enough, but um, this is gonna go on the bulkhead of the car. So the area between the engine and the uh, actual passenger compartment along that metal surface, that bulkhead, um, this is gonna get stuck on there and it's gonna be used to reflect the heat back into the engine bay. Um, something I've noticed just even with my naturally aspirated engine is that a lot of heat is transferred from the engine bay into the passenger compartment right along that back side there. Um, so I'm gonna give this a shot and see how it does. Um, who knows, might work out pretty well. And then finally, one of the most expensive parts that I've purchased for this build so far um, is a new gear set. Now, this gear set is pretty interesting. Um, when compared to a standard gear set, now this is a brand new, literally new cast gear set made by Mini Spares. It's called a Evo Heavy Duty Gear Set, and it's still helical because I don't want straight cut gears in my gearbox. They're loud, they're obnoxious, in my opinion, um, while they do have great performance benefits, I don't think that they're suited for a road car. Um, they just aren't, they don't handle the wear and tear as easily as uh, helical cut gears do for the road. Um, think about what people use straight cut gears for, um, racing, uh, dog boxes, things that require really great, perfect engagement and no power loss between the gears, which is what does happen a little bit with the helical style gears. But with straight cut gear applications, you end up a lot of times, um, people are always asking me, well, should I put straight cut gears in my car? And usually my answer is no, um, because most people, most people who are putting them in there for a specific need, they're generally going into race cars, which often are taken off the road after being absolutely beaten to death after about 800 to 1500 miles. Um, I mean, if you really boil it down, because they're get, hitting these racetracks, going back on the trailer, go to another racetrack, but it's not a lot of miles and they usually get rebuilt between each race period. Um, 
And so I did a lot of research and found these Evo heavy duty gears, which have been tested up to 175 horsepower, I think, or it's 200 horsepower, I forget. Um, Mini spare site talks about it, um, but they're extra wide. So what that means is they have more surface on each gear which allows you to spread the load from whatever power your engine is producing to more of a surface area. So you end up with a little bit more surface area handling that power. Um, and all of these gears are wider. And so with that, you end up with a really, really robust gear set um, that is gonna fit in a standard A plus box, which is super cool. Um, now with this, I'm gonna be taking the gearbox out of Bad Wolf and I'm gonna be replacing the gear set with this Evo gear set, um, but largely the remainder of the gearbox is gonna stay the same aside from the differential. That cross pin diff is gonna come out in favor of an LSD. And I do wanna to touch on that real quick. The reason I am going with an ATB, a fluid bias differential is that that fluid bias is gonna allow me to road the car. It's gonna allow me to drive the car on the road really easily without any adverse you know, um, impact to my steering or my general drivability, but it is going to dynamically allow me to deliver all the power or the majority of the power of the supercharged engine um, when I really punch on it, which is great. The cross, pin, the cross pin diff, while it is extremely robust and it's all about strengthening your differential, it doesn't actually help you deliver all of the power to the road. Um, it is still at its core an open diff, which means that if one wheel is slipping, it's gonna allow it to continue to slip while delivering as much power as it can to the other wheel. The whole point of an open differential is to allow the wheels to spin at different speeds. Um, there's some pretty cool videos out there that illustrate how that all works, but that is one of the reasons I'm moving to an LSD because I want all my power to hit the road, um, or at least go as far down as it can. You know, obviously the wheels and tires are gonna be a limitation as well because they're smaller, um, but we'll cross that road when we get to it. But that is gonna wrap up this episode. I wanted to show you guys what I've got so far um, so you know what's going on and you know I'm not just kind of like poking around over here not really making any videos. Um, if you have any questions about what I've purchased so far, obviously post them in the comment section below. And if you have any tips about this build you'd like to share with me as I'm waiting for some of the stuff to come in, um, definitely let me know. I wanna hear everything you guys you know, might suggest. Um, I don't know everything and I don't even pretend to know everything. Um, I want feedback and I, want, I always wanna learn. So with that, I think I'm gonna wrap up this episode. Again, thank you so much to my patrons for supporting me throughout this build. And thank you so much, 7 Mini Parts, for being a long-term part sponsor of this channel. And until the next episode, and until I see you guys again, you know the drill. Enjoy those minis, and motor on.